Hey guys, it's Danny. Today we are going to address this Phalaenopsis orchid. Looks spooky. It's spooky season. Um, yeah, something happened to it and I'm gonna tell you all about it. I'm gonna show you how I went about it because I already filmed the video with the repotting and hopefully this will help you out if you ever find yourself in a situation like I did, which as you will discover, it's not very common, but it happens. But before we start, don't forget to give this video a like if you end up enjoying it and why not subscribe? I post multiple times a week and it's completely free. But if you're feeling a little extra about it, do consider further supporting the channel by becoming a member, checking out the uh, affiliate links, official, affiliate links down below, checking out the merch or using the super thanks option below my videos. Right, so what happened to this orchid? It suffered from crown rot. Why? because I had a leaking AC in the greenhouse and the evac, I think, got jammed with something and it started to drip inside and it dripped on two of my Phalaenopsis, one above it and this one below. Now, the one above it managed to escape because it was dripping sort of on the edge of the pot, so all of the water was accumulating inside the pot and it didn't stay wet all that long. I didn't have root rot or anything, but this one below it, the water was dripping right in the stem or in the crown. And I didn't realize it for quite a while because it wasn't dripping all the time. So that water pulled in the crown of my orchid, accumulated bacteria and pathogens and started to crown rot it. And I didn't actually notice it until it was too late. The thing with crown rot is that if you catch it early, if you see those yellowing leaves on the crown early enough, you can actually act on it. And I do have a video that talks all about it. You can check it out down below. I'll make a short resume now. Typically what we wanna do is destroy the tissue of the crown, which is already affected, just to stop the infection from going downwards. So how I typically go about it is I remove whatever uh, leaves are yellow and don't look good, they're rotten. I put hydrogen peroxide right in the center to start killing off pathogens and also the first layer of cells that are damaged, and maybe a few good ones. And then I remove whatever water is left and put cinnamon powder just to maintain the area dry. And that works out in many cases. I will not say majority of the cases or anything because I don't know, I didn't make a statistics, but it works out in many cases. However, there are some cases in which the orchid just does not show you the signs or you just don't see it because you're busy, you have a lousy week at work or who knows, who knows what you're going through. There are moments in life where you just do not have the time to look at your orchid and crown rot advances like within a week, within a few days, it's, it's a pretty fast thing. So when you see it, it's already gone, it's already too late. So this was the case with this one. The orchid didn't actually show me much signs. One day, I thought one of the leaves was a little pale, but then I thought, oh, maybe I'm just imagining things. And the other day, it was crown rot. And as you will see in the recording with the repotting, the leaf on top is still attached to the orchid. It didn't even have time to fall, although it looked very yellow. So I didn't catch it in time. Luckily for me, the infection stopped by itself, which can happen as well. In some cases, not always. The orchid can actually stop the infection by itself without intervention. And that was my luck. So there was no need for me to place anything in the crown. As you will see, I just had to remove the top and you know, that was that. So that's what happened to this particular orchid. We have some thrips damage that has nothing to do with it. And there are no more thrips on the orchid, but the crown was damaged by the leaking AC, which created that pool. So now we're gonna go back in time and I'm gonna show you how I went about this orchid because it was a new orchid, it needed repotting anyway. And then I, future Danny, will come back at the end of the video to make the outro. Alrighty guys, so this is what we are working with. Now, P.S. Please excuse the construction noises outside. There isn't much that I can do other than try to cover it with some music. And as you guys know, things are never quiet in my neighborhood. But recently, it's really loud. So I do apologize for that. So, 
it is very important to remove this bad and dried stem because it can actually retain more water and pathogens than a healthy stem. Whatever is dried will act a little bit like a sponge and being that it's already done, it will start to break down, it will accumulate all sorts of pathogens and microbes and so on and it can actually further or restart the infection. Will I be putting water on top of my orchids? No, but you don't know how accidents can happen. And if there is one thing that I've learned in this more than a decade of growing orchids is that unplanned stuff happen and sometimes it's out of your control. So I have here a sanitized pair of pruners. I'm going with this and not scissors because the stem is actually pretty strong, especially when it's dry. So if you're ever in the situation to make a really clean cut and not further damage the stem, I would recommend you use any type of shears that are meant for the garden. Dried stems are really, really tough. So what I will do is cut the stem right above the first set of green leaves. Now, I know that the stem is not affected further because this orchid has been in this state for a while and the infection did not go down further. It just stopped. So you can see that at the top, I do have signs of coronal rot and infection. So this side can completely come off, but you can see here we have the first set of um, roots and also the leaves. So I'm going to cut a little further up just to see how my stem is looking like. It should be completely dry, it flew, but it is actually completely dry. So because I see a completely dried stem, I will go ahead and cut even lower. The more dried sheets I can remove, the better. All right, things are still dry, which is good. It's what I want to see. I'm also going to remove these dried flower spikes. And yeah, at this point, you know what? I think I'm gonna go close the windows completely. It's gonna get a little hot, but it's a little noisy, I believe. I was hoping I wouldn't have to use the AC in the middle of October and uh, you know have lower electricity bills, but that's not gonna happen. So let's turn on the AC because I'm gonna get cooked. All right, so I will try to further clean the area without actually damaging the existing stem. I will also repot this orchid because it is one of the newer orchids and I didn't get a chance to repot it just yet, so I'll go ahead and do that. But if you have an orchid which is freshly repotted or you know there's no need to repot it, you don't have to repot an orchid that has crown rot. Now already, and I'll give you a close up, my orchid is working on a basil cakey. This is what happens when Phalaenopsis orchids lose their crown. This will happen somewhere where there is still good stem available. In order to obtain a keiki from one such orchid, you don't really have to do anything. The orchid is already quote unquote programmed genetically to do so. So no need to apply all sorts of potions, which again are liquid and might initiate another infection. So do not put magical potions that you see on the internet on sick orchids. They're already sensitive. They're already a little bit out of plan B's. Don't do that. They know what they're supposed to do and they will do so without your help. What we are doing here is just making sure that we eliminate as many risk factors as possible. Right, so I cut away the top of the orchid. It is somewhere on the floor at this moment. So the next thing that I will do is repot this orchid just because I'm already working with it. I could leave it like that, but if the medium is old, that poses a risk factor. And I want this orchid to be as safe as possible since it is much more fragile than a completely healthy orchid. So I'm gonna gather my materials and I will be back when I'm done. Alrighty, so this orchid is actually potted in a cocoa peat mixture with some bark. There's more cocoa peat than bark here, honestly. It's not the most ideal mixture, I must say, for home environments. I could actually get away with this mixture because I live in such a warm, borderline hot environment for most of the year. But generally speaking, if you're in a temperate climate, I don't find this type of medium being the best because it can actually retain quite a lot of water. Now, for the purposes of experimenting and because I have an issue with sphagnum moss, it is not available all that much in my area and it is very, very expensive. I might do some experiments, 
with some coconut husk, not cocoa peach. This is too fine, even for me. But maybe with some coconut husk, which I don't really like. I tried it before. I don't like that much, but if I have to, it is a viable option as well. So leaving this orchid in this medium wasn't all that bad for me in my climate, but I would actually go ahead and repot these orchids into something else if your environment is cooler than mine or temperate. Luckily for me, the roots are absolutely fine. What a big root system this orchid has. I'm not going to remove anything that is healthy, even if the root system is big, I'm not going to cut it away or anything of the sorts to make it fit in a pot. If it doesn't fit in here, I can just use a different pot. We need all of the structures we can get at this point since we're dealing with a sick orchid. I'm looking because I think I saw a dried root. Yes, I have a little dried bit here. So this is all that I'm going to cut, nothing else. Oh, there's a little dried bit here as well. And that is about it. This orchid was in actually very, very good shape. Apart from the crown rot and also a bit of damage from the thrips. The thrips are gone. Thankfully, my treatment absolutely worked. And this actually did not happen because of my treatment. It happened because of the AC. Um, so I'll try to pay a little bit more attention to my AC now that it's fixed. Hopefully we're not going to have issues, uh, but yeah, right. So let's make a little bit of a test fit here. I could actually get away with this size or mm, not so much. This orchid will produce another ton of roots. That's how Phalaenopsis work. So I'm actually going to go for a slightly larger pot than this, which sucks a little because of the sphagnum moss situation. Fear not though, I shall combine it with bark. Right, so I'm gonna throw away all of this old medium. It does smell a little bit off and it's also not to my liking. So I'll be right back. All right, so this looks a little bit more fitting. Yes, absolutely. And we can ensure about two years worth of growth as well in this pot. Right, so I'm going to be using a mixture of sphagnum moss and bark for the time being. I am currently in the process of finding an alternative for my Phalaenopsis since I have a lot of them. Do I have 70 of them? I think I counted 70 at some point. I love them. I adore collecting them. They make my life so much brighter, but they take up a lot of resources. Now, the good thing is they are very tolerant when it comes to the potting mixes that I can use. So I have quite a bit of flexibility. I'm currently experimenting with some perlite and I will have to say, I don't really like all that much how things are going. Um, so I am on the lookout for just exchanging this mixture that I actually really, really like. And I prefer to keep the sphagnum moss for the more finicky type of orchids, for the tinier orchids. This is not even a fully grown Phalaenopsis. My fully grown mini Phalaenopsis are larger than this. So when I say they consume a lot of resources, I mean it. So I'm looking for alternatives, uh, but until I find something viable that can actually work out with my lifestyle and the way that I water and I treat them, until then I'm gonna go with the typical mixture of sphagnum moss and bark. I'm not using just sphagnum moss, just to conserve my rapidly dwindling sphagnum moss reserve. <laughs> So yeah, I'm just gonna add enough sphagnum moss to ensure that water is dragged from the bottom all the way to the top, making sure the sphagnum moss layers are connected between them. Um, but I'm not going to be using a lot of sphagnum moss, just enough to make this medium absorbent throughout. Bark is a really good medium for most orchids, but in certain environments, it's not performing all that great especially in warm environments such as mine, because it doesn't actually retain water and it's also not wicking quite at all. So I will have mostly water at the bottom and nothing at the top, which is not going very well with my watering technique. I'm using a bamboo skewer to direct the pieces of bark all the way in between the layers so I don't have very big air pockets. There we go. Yeah, so it's absolutely fine to just use bark. It's 
just not the most ideal situation for some environments. Right, this might actually be the last layer of sphagnum moss. So as you can see, I didn't really use all that much sphagnum moss for this pot, which is um, a 14 centimeters, I would say. If this is 13, this is about 14 diameter, I would say. So yeah, not a whole lot of sphagnum moss at all. I will also do something for Phalaenopsis, which tend to be quite heavy feeders. I will also add some slow release fertilizer, which I typically used to do now that I have access to the MSU. Once again, I don't, but I find myself in a position where I just don't have the time to prepare the water, so I'm just watering with normal water, and that's fine. I can get away with most orchids. Phalaenopsis, though, are heavier feeders, so um, yeah, they perform better when they have more fertilizer at the, their disposal. So just because I know myself, I'm gonna use slow release fertilizer with the Phalaenopsis, um, at least for now. I would love it if I could get my grubby little hands on some slow release MSU fertilizer. Problem is, I'm not located in the USA. And there are some issues importing fertilizers to the EU from other territories, some major issues. So major that when I tried, when Repotme actually sent me, which they're my collaborators, by the way, when they tried to send me the MSU fertilizer and a few things a few years ago, the Ministry of Agriculture got in contact with me and they really wanted me to pay for the destruction of those products. Luckily, I found a very nice lady from the ministry that understood that I, I, I wasn't actually doing a business, it was just a container of fertilizer. Uh, I wasn't trying to import anything uh, to sell. So yeah, they took care and disposed of the thing. It was a whole fiasco, I'm not gonna go through that. So what I'm using here is an Osmocote, which I found locally within the European Union, I mean, not locally in my country. There's nothing like this in my country as far as I know. Um, so yeah, that's a, it's a whole drama with trying to obtain luxuries such as the MSU fertilizer. <laughs> uh, but yeah, sometimes I get lucky, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I'm alone, sometimes I'm not. <laughs> So if you have full access to MSU fertilizers, I envy you, you're very lucky. I don't, I have to rely on chance and luck sometimes. So anyway, back to our story, I do still use the water soluble MSU fertilizer, but it doesn't really harm anything to add some slow release Osmocote in there as well for Phalaenopsis at least. Catleas as well, because they can, some of them tend to feed a lot. Stuff like Oncidiums, not necessary, um, I would say. Whatever orchids tend to grow big and have massive structures, yeah, they benefit from slow release or orchids that grow very fast, like Catacetums, they do benefit from addition of slow release, uh, but stuff like Oncidiums and other finicky things like Miltoniopsis and such, no, I wouldn't bother. But this being a hungry Phalaenopsis, I did add. Right, so I am done with the repotting. To be fully honest, I don't even know which one this orchid is. We're gonna find out. I'm gonna water it. And probably the intro and outro of this video will be made by future Danny, which will have a full set of makeup on her face and will look pretty. At the moment, I don't look very pretty. I'm not actually prepared for filming, but I have to get some projects done. Right, so that is about it for me. I'm gonna pass this video on to future Danny. Alrighty, and here we are today, a few days after, and the cake I showed you has grown a little bit more. Phalaenopsis cakeys grow pretty fast. Do you guys remember last year I had my beautiful first orchid ever of my entire life? My mom sent it to me. It had crown rot. I didn't know how it happened. I crown rotted it somehow. Um, but I managed to save a cakey, and I posted this when? At the beginning of this year or last year? Let me show you how big that cakey got. How big do you think it is? Make a bet in your mind. I'm gonna show you how big it is. <laughs> there. Is it a cakey anymore or a full grown orchid? It's a full grown orchid. <laughs> so I'm gonna look back in the archive and see when I actually repotted it. Uh, there she is. This is my very first ever orchid. Well, a cakey of it. And I cannot wait for it to bloom. It's its name is vanilla because it has vanilla like flowers but yeah look at it look how marvelous it is 
This growth happened within a year. So I don't know if this one will look in a year like this, but it has the potential. It will be pretty large anyway. They grow fast, these keikis, and they have the potential to bloom. Oh, you can even see the mother plant is here. It still has one leaf left. Um, so there we have it. This orchid can bloom this year. It is huge, isn't it? And as you can see, because I remember at the time, whenever I do these repottings, there is a comment saying that I completely overpotted something. I don't believe in overpotting. And because I don't believe in it, it doesn't exist. So I don't have issues. Uh, no. I control what's inside the pot, so size doesn't matter to me. And this is a huge orchid, and I knew it was huge. Imagine placing this orchid in a smaller pot with this root system. No. I can feel the roots through the pot already. Imagine what's in the pot if that's what you see on the surface. So, yeah, overpotted and doing just dandy. Right, so. That is enough for today. Hopefully this orchid will have the same, let's say, trajectory as this one. I'm hoping to have some flowers from this one as well. This one this year obviously will not have flowers. I cannot even remember which one this was. It's a flower shop one. I just forgot to put a tag on it. So this year will not have flowers, but that's okay. Next year the keiki for sure, I think, will be capable of blooming. But yeah, this is how you can sometimes save orchids from rotting. Mind you, this will not happen all of the time. If you remember, I have an old, old video with a couple of orchids that a friend brought over. They were already gone. They had no live stem anymore. In that instance, you know, you can wait around and see what happens because you never know. Maybe there is a little bit of stem that is left. But if you really, really don't see anything green, you know, chances are nothing will happen. So if your orchid gets to that level, I think it's a little too late. But that's okay. Don't be sad about it. Just learn from it. This is how. You know we all learn and in the end yeah be sure that pools don't accumulate in the crown of your orchid because in homes they just don't evaporate fast enough there's no wind so they just stay there and accumulate bacteria you might have your orchid upright not how they naturally grow like this so the water just stays in there yeah not a good idea to have water in the crown of your orchid but anyway all is well when it ends well. Righty, so that is about it for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. Hope you've enjoyed hanging out with me today. Hopefully this will help you out. With that said, I'll see you next time. Bye.